Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up and this week we're going to talk about early access journalism, the practice of companies picking and choosing who gets early access to hot products. We're going to look at the NVIDIA and the hardware unbox scandal that happened this week along with the recent developments related to Cyberpunk 2077 and the very tight review restrictions they had for that product before release. And then, of course, we have to bring up some things regarding Apple and some mainstream journalists as well. Let's get to it. So let's begin with the NVIDIA versus hardware unboxed scandal. Uh, they just this morning put up a video talking about their side of the story. This had largely developed from a tweet that they sent out earlier in the week. And then Linus and a lot of the other popular tech YouTubers kind of filled in some of the blanks. But now they have their own story up. And I'll link that video down below in the video description. But in a nutshell, what happened is they posted up this tweet saying that NVIDIA had decided to cut them off from receiving GeForce Founders Edition GPU samples. And for an independently run channel like this, that can often be a death knell because you need those cards early based on how all these algorithms work so that you have your review ready on the day of release. Because oftentimes these companies embargo outlets from publishing anything about the product until it's actually available for customers. Now, of course, NVIDIA cards are almost impossible to get these days, but nonetheless, they come out on a day and they have an embargo date that everyone posts their reviews on. And Hardware Unbox apparently did not get a Founders Edition card from the company directly like they usually did. And they were curious, so they reached out to NVIDIA. And NVIDIA wrote back with this rather long and condescending email about how they didn't like the way that Hardware Unbox was covering their products. They wanted more attention on a ray tracing feature versus a rasterization feature. They made a kind of a dig at them saying that uh, regular customers have to buy the product and you don't, yada, yada. And of course, everything erupted from there. Uh, now, NVIDIA has since reversed course on this due to all the pressure they were getting from even larger outlets like Linus Tech Tips and Jay's Two Cents and everybody. But still, this is exactly what I've been talking about for a while in that the industry can pick and choose uh, who gets what and when. And in many cases, people that are independent operators are feeling a little pressure to be a little less independent or let the company kind of direct things because if you don't get access to the product, you're not gonna be competitive from a click and view standpoint. And one of the things that I was wondering about was whether or not NVIDIA and Hardware Unboxed had an influencer agreement. And if they did, NVIDIA would of course be within their rights to say, no, we don't like the way you're covering this product. Here's this agreement you signed and you said you were gonna cover it a certain way and you didn't, so we're pulling it. And I suspect there might be something like that here. I did reach out to the Hardware Unboxed guys to see if there was in fact an agreement between them and the company. They did not get back to me. And we talked a little bit about this in a video that I did a little while back about influencer marketing agencies and the practices that they employ on these types of campaigns. And usually what happens is it begins with an initial email. You then get an NDA that follows and the NDA restricts you from talking about any kind of agreement that they send after you sign the NDA. And a lot of creators get stuck into this mess. And you feel a bit conflicted because you want this product on release date because it's going to help get you views. If you've got maybe one of seven or eight videos up on a popular product on day one, you're going to do much better over the long term than someone who's going to have to buy it and wait a week to get their review up properly. And there's some real advantages to that. And here is why I never signed these agreements. Here's one I received after the video that I shot complaining about this practice in the industry. This, by the way, came from another major brand and they basically spelled out exactly how they wanted this review structured and because they want you to sign an NDA ahead of time you really can't tell the audience that the agreement even exists because you're under a strict NDA that considers every kind of communication done between you and the company off the record and confidential and as a result you've got a lot of stuff getting pushed out there that may not be a compensated review but the company had input into the editorial process. And many times they also want to see the video before it gets uploaded. And this puts a small creator in a tough position because if you're trying to build your channel, you want to get this stuff in early enough so that you have a shot at getting some search traffic to build your audience more. And the companies know this, and that's the big issue that I see here playing out. 
And we're kind of at a disadvantage, both the creators and the consumers. And the reason is back in the old days, like in the 80s, you had maybe a half a dozen media outlets that covered this stuff because it was so expensive to reach a mass audience with a magazine or a TV show like the Computer Chronicles. And now these companies can just pick and choose. When Hardware Unboxed stops doing stuff the way you want them to do it, cut them off and get somebody else in there that's hungrier and they'll, they'll go ahead and cover the product the way you want to do it. And of course these companies are within their rights to send products to whoever they want. And I think one of the things that we have to decide as independent content creators is whether or not we want to be considered a journalist or an influencer. And I don't think there's a lot of room in between anymore, at least if you're trying to maintain the trust of the audience. And I think what's been great about this whole discussion over the last week is that outlets like Linus and Jay's Two Cents have been able to kind of elevate this discussion in a way that hasn't been out there enough, in my opinion, to get people thinking about this kind of thing. I have nothing against influencers, provided they disclose things properly, but I'm getting so sick of hearing people with a cheeky little line like, that's why I'm working with, or that's why I partnered with, instead of saying, hey, they're paying me to pre present this content to you, and they told me exactly what to say. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that has to get disclosed to people so they know where you're coming from. And this has been my longstanding gripe in this industry from the get-go. But there are some ethical questions related to journalism and the access that companies grant to products early. And here's a good example, the iPhone 12 Pro, uh, which by the way came out on October 23rd. Now, Apple gives out phones to many media outlets ahead of the release date. Now, they don't give them away, they're given out on loan, but there's a set number of them, and these reviewers have time to go and make their reviews so that when the embargo lifts, usually a couple days before release, uh, those folks can get their content out and front and center uh, in front of people that are very hungry for content about a new product like this, who want an independent look at something. And here's a couple of examples of what published on October 20th. Uh, this was the Wall Street Journal. Joanna Stern did a great review of the phone and she had enough time to do a whole review on the phone and get some time at an empty stadium to test out 5G wireless. And as you can see here, uh, she was able to get that review up on October 20th, three days before the phone launched. Now, unfortunately, she didn't get all that many views on YouTube for the effort. Uh, but she still had it up early, and of course the Wall Street Journal benefits because they make most of their money from their uh, print and online operations outside of these online platforms. And I always pick on her, and I feel bad about it because I do respect her work quite a bit, uh, but she did post up something after the fact saying certainly having it early is a benefit. It does allow reviewers to provide perspective before the on-sale date in most cases. So while it is true that the customer does get some perspective and a benefit from that perspective, it also provides a significant benefit to the publication who's able to get that content out in front of people and be one of a few versus being one of many. Uh, here's another example, The Verge's review. This is their uh, review of the phone that came out on October 20th. This is the number two search result on YouTube for an iPhone 12 Pro review right now. So they're continuing to benefit from all of the accumulated watch time that they had before the rest of the world got their hands on the phone. And that translates into, for them, probably tens of thousands of dollars in ad revenue. Now, in fairness to The Verge, they have an extensive ethics statement on their website that I think is one of the best ones in the industry. And what's nice about publishing a statement like this is that it not only gives your readers an idea as to what you stand for and how you're going to approach your content, it also gives people within the operation guidelines that they have to follow. It really serves two purposes that help build trust. I have one as well, which is linked down in the video description. Now, mine's a little different than The Verge's because The Verge is a large media conglomeration, and they can separate a lot of the advertising portion of the business from the editorial side. I don't yet have that luxury, but one day I'll build myself up to that level and uh, we'll be able to have a separate sales department. That's my dream, I'm gonna keep working at it. Um, but I do give them, again, a lot of credit for covering all these things in their ethical guidelines and making sure that uh, viewers have the opportunity to see the guidelines that they follow so they can decide whether or not to trust the publication. However, the one thing that they don't talk about is the fact that they do have a significant economic advantage by getting something like the iPhone 12 early enough that they can publish an extensive detailed review three days before the phone comes out. And back in the old days, nobody would question this because you know what, there's only a couple of big publications that can get that stuff in, but now we're in this commoditized media environment where everybody's got a shot 
provided we can earn enough watch time from the viewership. And the select group that gets that early watch time is significantly advantaged over those who don't. And I'll be honest, if Apple approached me and asked me to borrow a phone two weeks ahead of launch, I certainly would do it because it provides a advantage over the competition. And we have to think about that versus the ethical implications that are at play here. Is this impacting our judgment in any way? And that's something that should be discussed. I don't have the answers here, but it's something that should be discussed. And let me show you what I mean about this commoditized nature of the business. So my iPhone 12 Pro, uh, which I purchased, came in on Friday, October 23rd at 9.37 a.m. at my mailbox. I drove out there, picked it up. I did a little live stream unboxing it and getting it set up. I posted the unboxing video to my extras channel on release day, but it did terribly because there was so much content coming out from everybody else who got their iPhone on that, on that day. And here we've got some results from the review that I did and uploaded about a week later. I spent a little bit more time on it because given that the extras channel unboxing didn't attract a lot of viewership, I knew it wouldn't do well. And as you can see here, the video fell well under my average viewership. So that uh, gray uh, kind of longer, thicker line there is my typical. And the blue line is what this video got for views. And here we are in December now, and I had maybe 5,400 views on it. So it definitely performed uh, below average for a video on my channel. The good news is, is that it attracted many more subscriber views than non-subscribers. And this speaks to the commoditized nature of content because... Uh, you got this in your timeline because you were subscribed to me and you were more likely to click on it. But because so many other people were covering the phone at the exact same time, my non-subscription views were much lower. And if you take a look here at my average viewership on the channel for every other video that I do, it's flipped. Usually I get more results from search and algorithm uh, versus those of you who are subscribed to the channel. And this really speaks to the fact that if you had that early advantage, people searching or looking for information about this would have been more likely to have the video recommended to them uh, versus those who uploaded the video on or after launch day. And sometimes these early reviews can result in real consumer harm. And there's no better example than what happened with the release of Cyberpunk 2077 this past week. Now, the company that makes the game, CD Projekt Red, handpicked a bunch of reviewers who would get a code to review the game ahead of its official release date. They had a very strict embargo. The people that reviewed the game could write about it and talk about it in their YouTube videos, but they couldn't use the footage that they captured from the game. They had to use footage provided by the company. And they also did not hand out any codes for the console version of the game that would run on the PlayStation 4 or the Xbox One, for example. And they even went so far as to issue DMCA takedowns of people who received the game that they purchased in the mail ahead of the release time. In fact, they put up this tweet threatening people with those takedowns if they published anything before the game actually released. And all of the restrictions that the company put in place paid off because it was very favorably reviewed. Here's IGN, they gave it a nine out of 10. They called it amazing, right? And then if you look over on Metacritic, you can see the Metascore uh, was 90 on that one, which consisted mostly of all the review outlets that got it ahead of time. The user score though is very different because when the game came out, the PC version was living up to what the reviewers saw because that's all they saw. But the game on console was another story. It didn't really play well at all. In fact, it was pretty much unplayable on the PS4 and the Xbox One. Slow frame rates, graphics all out of whack, bugs up the wazoo. It really wasn't the game that everyone expected based on the reviews that they were seeing here. And take a look at what IGN's YouTube viewership looks like on this. Now, the middle one here on the list was the one that was published initially under the restrictions that uh, CD Projekt Red, the developer, had placed on the video. So they said you could only use our footage when you review the game initially. And so they posted one review there up in the middle a week ago. That's received 4.4 million views. They subsequently released a new version of the review with the footage that they shot. That one accumulated 1.2 million views. But their video talking about how the failures on the last gen console were inexcusable only racked up 687,000 views. So there's no question in my mind that console gamers 
saw this initial set of reviews and said, yes, we understand the graphics may not be as good as the PC version, but it should be playable, right? It's CD Projekt Red after all. So guess what? They pre-ordered the game and had that game digitally delivered to their console in between the time that those reviews came out and when the game officially launched because most folks don't have a super fast internet connection and it takes a long time to push down 40, 50, 60 gigabytes or whatever that game takes over to your console over that connection. And it's very difficult to return a digitally purchased game. You've got to go through a whole process. And Sony, of course, on the PlayStation 4 side has been very reluctant to offer refunds even when the product being offered is essentially garbage, which is what a lot of first gen or current gen console owners got. The game runs better on the PS4 Pro and on the new uh, console generation, the PS5 and the Xbox Series X, but still a lot of consumers spent money on something that was not the experience that reviewers got. And those reviewers racked up a lot of money and a lot of views from that early access that they had. Look at this, 5.6 million views for that initial review that misled a lot of customers to buy something that uh, turned out not to be what they thought they were getting. Uh, Kotaku in Australia has a good article looking at this issue, which is definitely worth a read and whether or not these outlets should have waited or insisted that they got a copy of the console version too before putting their reviews out so people would know what to expect. Uh, the company that made the game, CD Projekt Red, did a mea culpa on Twitter, I think last night or this morning, uh, apologizing for all of this. They knew exactly what they were doing by not handing out the review codes for the console versions because that would have diminished the score that they received. And I read some other reports that apparently co company bonuses are tied to the Metacritic score. So there was a lot of incentive for the company to hold back the bad stuff and only send out the good stuff early. And of course, the bad stuff came out immediately after it launched. And now there's a big backlash. So they are uh, allowing people to refund the game if they are unhappy with it. Although they're pompously asking people to give them another chance after misleading them like that. Not cool. Uh, but there you go, and I think there's some real consumer harm here when these things happen. And look how quickly we all found out the truth once those games got out there. And that's kind of the advantage of the commodity media environment that we're in. Bad stuff gets out quickly. Remember AntennaGate and BenGate on the iPhone? Similar stuff, right? Once consumers get their hands on something, we have a much louder voice now on these platforms. And it's going to get harder and harder to control things. And I think those of us who are advantaged with early access to things need to think about the responsibility that we have when we have an early product and temper that versus our desire to get the video up first ahead of others. Now, what I'm looking to do now is change the way that I approach my early access to products when I get them. I don't often get things early, but I have updated my disclosures, my own ethics statement for the channel, which you can find on screen here. And what I did is I added a paragraph today uh, to clarify this topic because it was something that I didn't have in my own ethics statement. So I will now be disclosing when I receive a product and review it ahead of its release. So a lot to think about after this past week. And it was interesting to see these two big stories erupt in the tech space that were very different, but really about the same thing. And I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. We all have a lot to talk about. And I'd love to hear your insights, so definitely have at it in the comment stream. Now, this week's wrap-up, as usual, is being brought to you by all of you. I want to thank Jay Rose for his super chat this week on a live stream that we did. I also want to thank two new supporters this week, Cecilia Marill, who contributed via the YouTube membership program, and TT Show, who joined up via float plane. I want to thank these folks and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis and all of you who watch on a regular basis too, especially those of you who watch those iPhone reviews because all of those things equal channel growth. Now, if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and sign up for our donor box page, but we also support the YouTube membership program with the join button down below. And we're on Linus's float plane platform too, and you can sign up there to help contribute to the channel. We put all of our videos up there too. We have other channels you can follow me on, including the Extras channel. We've got the podcast, which is an audio version of this show. And definitely take a look at my Amazon page and follow me there because we sometimes do live streams on Amazon that we don't do on YouTube. So definitely check me out over there and hit the follow button. 
Uh, you can also engage with the channel through our infrequent email list at lon.tv slash email. We got the Facebook group, which is growing by leaps and bounds every day. And then of course, we've got the store where I sell the previously used items that I purchased for a reasonable price. Uh, these are items that have been previously reviewed. There's one of everything. So if you want to get notified whenever I add one of those things to the store, sign up for the email list for the store at lon.tv slash store alert. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. I tried to shorten up the end of it here. Let me know what you thought of that. And I'll see you next week. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the lon.tv supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Jim Peter, Tom Albrecht and Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.